So my name is Francesco Pepe. I work at uh, the Department of Astronomy of the Geneva University in Switzerland. I am a professor in astronomy at the Geneva University, uh, but I've started my career in the planet business as a project manager and system engineer in building instruments, for example, harps. I upgraded together with my team uh, Coralie, uh, then I was involved in other uh, instrumentation like the Prima interferometer on the VLT, uh, and then later on uh, Harp Snores and Espresso. I was al uh, always, when I was a student, had the better feeling for technology, optics, and so on. So I, I, I like this very much. And so my PhD was already uh, in this domain. So I, I helped building far-infrared uh, liquid helium, uh, uh, liquid helium cooled uh, far-infrared Fabry Perot. <laughs> so when my project ended at uh, ETH, the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, um, I was called by uh, the former instrumentation professor here at the Geneva Observatory, who asked me whether I would be interested in succeeding him because he, he was retiring. And so I, I, I said, yes, it would be nice to continue this balloon-born uh, business. I came here and my goal, so I was supposing, was to upgrade this gondolas and the technology of stabilization and so on. But when I got at the Geneva Observatory, I was taken into a room with all the professors here and they said, okay, so you are now employed at the Geneva Observatory, but balloon-borne stuff is not really of interest for us, to us. So what we want to do is now, you know, Michel Mayor discovered an exoplanet we want you to build a new spectrograph for ESO. There will be a call for tender and you have to answer and to build the instrument. There is no discussion. I said, okay, good. So I was kidnapped by Michel Mayor and this was my biggest opportunity and biggest luck in my career. I am an Etwis born Italian and I am, let's say in my character, uh, I am half Swiss German and half Italian. What, what happens is that sometimes you have to be very strict, you have to follow rules and be very precise in how you proceed. But other moments, you just have to accept that you are in an unforeseen situation and you have to be creative. And I think it's a, it's a mixture of both all the time, okay? Now we have an unforeseen situation and we have to, to find a solution. I do not care whose fault it is or what is the reason for this problem. It's not, as I, I like to say, the problem is not the problem, but the attitude you have when you see a problem. And the attitude you have to see, the first, objective is to find a solution. You want to build the best possible instrument and nobody has done this before. So you know where you start, but you don't know where you end. I can tell you something about my, let's say the, the baseline strategy, which whether we like it or not, is influenced by a matter of fact. And the matter of fact is that we have commitments, okay? We, are, we have commit, financial commitments, we get an, a limited amount of money. And on the other hand, you sign a contract with an organization or so, and there it's written, this spectrograph has to reach this precision and this and this and this, so the requirements. And it's, uh, as you, I mean, we all, we, we make all the same mistakes because we are uh, scientists 
we want to build the best possible instrument and we write this into the requirements and we are so stupid because they will take the requirements and tell you yeah, but you you wrote this yeah because i saw that we would but it, it's there is no guarantee i'm just trying to do the best so that that is the constraint and on the other hand you have an, a limited amount of money because they are not giving you twice as much just because they are risk when you when you give a subcontract to the company and you ask them to do something they have never done before they won't invoice you what they think it will cost they will invoice you also the risk that they failed the first time or the second time we cannot do that so this is the framework in which we are placed when we have to evaluate risks and my strategy has been the following let's do things we are we know how to do at least there where we know that it's sufficient okay so let's not reinvent the wheel if it's not necessary when we uh, build harps we were not doubting about the fact that we need to do it with a initial grading cross the special initial grading we we knew that this would be the basics. So we, we didn't reinvent a new instrument. We knew from uh, Coralie that the stability was a question. The question is, would we be able to reach one meter per second precision knowing that the spectrograph moves due to air pressure changing by several hundred meters per second? And there we said, okay, here we have to change something. Let's put the spectrograph in vacuum. And this could be considered as a risk. And it, did, it was a risk. But for me, it was actually less risk than not putting into vacuum. And then we were asked to do a polarimeter, to, to put a polarimeter in. And they said, look, I'm not a specialist, but we are not doing polarimetry with harps. We are doing radio velocities. So if you can't convince me that polarimetry is really needed, I won't do it. And I was criticized for that. What I tell to my people or to people responsible for broad projects, please define which is your real science objective because this will guide you through the whole project when you have to take decisions whether you do it so or so. We are now entering a scale where you cannot just build a spectrograph yourself. For Espresso, we had to work in a bigger team. Uh, we, we had a consortium of seven institutes and the funding, of course, you cannot control the others institute funding, it's not possible. It's not a big company where there are channels you know, uh, of funding and you, and you say top down, you have to do this and you have to do, no, 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 no. There is all the time you have to convince, you have to negotiate. And, uh, okay, here in Europe, we have really this, and Switzerland is a, you know, you have to find a consensus. You, to, you have to make things the other that we have decided something together, even if you know already where you want to go. <laughs> but okay, it's, it's a proce process. And, and this is a big challenge, but it's also a beautiful opportunity. I think we still haven't managed to get a real perfectly stable detector system. And this re concerns the cryostat, the readout, the CT effects, so the deep physics in the de CCD detectors. And now we are talking about CMOS, but which has even, even other problems. So there is still a lot uh, to be done and to be understood. Okay, if we go to the second level, the calibration is another issue. We have not yet solved. We are in 2020. I still haven't got the the laser frequency comb of my dreams. Even if you have a perfect calibrator, you still have to know 
how do you extract the information you got into this chip? Okay, either calibration information or stellar information. To make an example, the PSF. The PSF will affect the radial velocity of a narrow line of the calibration source differently compared to a broad line of the star. A more funny story is the one, maybe because this is, uh, you know, we built harps. Uh, this is the De La Silla Observatory, and the La Silla Observatory is known also for the Swiss telescope, where we have a very nice kitchen, and it is known for having nice parties, despite the fact that they are forbidden. So please, uh, okay. It's an official interview, but don't tell anybody, even if everybody knows about it. <laughs> anyway, I think it's, we never exaggerated, but this was, this is part of the Swiss telescope having, doing good work. You can only do good work in a nice environment with nice people. And having a fondue at the end of the day with a little bit of wine is part of it. So, so, but how do you transport the cheese, which is made, is made of raw milk, okay, uh, so uh, to, to Chile? And how do you transport the raclette oven? Okay, it's the one where you melt the half cheese uh, in, together with your spectrograph which formerly you are not allowed to transport private material when you import it to Chile. So we had to declare <laughs> the, the raclette oven as a instrument to melt, um, uh, how it's called, uh, enduit, which is some kind of, you know, plastic for, to isolate, okay. So this this was this was the official denomination in the in the in the packing list, and the cheese was not declared. We put it into the vacuum vessel. No, I'm joking, but that's what we were talking uh, telling the others. The problem is that if we had put it into the vacuum vessel, we have we would have had to outgas the vacuum vessel for years because of the the smell of the cheese. So no, we were not allowed to do that. And. Another funny story, and I will stop with this one. I like this very much. You know that Harps is in an enclosure, so it's an isolation box. And then we have another enclosure, which is air conditioned actively. And this outer enclosure, we have um, a locker. Okay. And we had written in our uh, hazard list a risk that somebody enters the room and brings uh, the instrument out of equilibrium and so on and so on. So we locked it. It was it's a locker like you know in the in the in the movies. <laughs> okay. But okay, this somehow this came to the ears of journalists. And when we discovered uh, mu R uh, C, then a journalist called Gaspar Locurto, who was at that time the instrument scientist, so responsible for uh, uh, for for harps uh, in La Silla. And the journalist asked Gaspar, Gaspar, is this true that harps is locked inside a room? Yeah, yes, it's true. And is it true? that the key is deposited in a Swiss bank in Zurich? And he answered, yes, it's absolutely true. And this appeared like that in the newspaper. Of course, it was not true, but it was so typical for a Swiss-led instrument. So we let, we let the journalists believe it.